Good morning to everybody once again. Great pleasure to be joining with you and thank you for joining with me as we continue with the parable of Jesus. But just before then to say, please pray for Lorna Jackson, who's had another fall. She's in um, hospital as is Di Liebich because of swelling in her leg. And we continue to pray for Christine um, Archer as well. And so we come today to the parable of the tenants in Luke chapter 20. It's the last parable that Jesus uh, told. It's one of his most important parables because we find it in Matthew, Mark uh, and Luke. It's a lot more uh, direct than the other parables. It's a matter of days before he comes to the end of his life. And so perhaps he feels he can speak with greater directness than had been the case earlier. So let's read it and then we'll have a look at it in um, three stages. Luke chapter 20 and from verse 9. Uh, Jesus went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He then sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And so they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. And so Jesus is coming towards the end of his journey uh, to Jerusalem. He knows what lies uh, ahead of him. And he tells this very direct parable. He is borrowing the imagery from the vineyard that the prophet Isaiah used in Isaiah chapter 5 when Isaiah said the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. So the vineyard here in the story that Jesus tells is the same as Isaiah's. It was Israel the people of God. The one who planted the vineyard is God himself. The servants he had sent as ambassadors were clearly the prophets from the Old Testament. And the wicked tenant to whom the Lord Jesus says are responsible for the vineyard's uh, unproductiveness. Well, who are they? Well, they represent Israel's rulers and leaders and religious uh, elite. And so uh, they understand, of course, that he is speaking directly about them. But then, in a more general way, Jesus is speaking here about the human condition. He's not only describing Israel when he talks about the vineyard. He's describing for us any and every situation on this fallen and rebellious planet on which we live, where God's divine blessing has been answered by human contempt and by human waywardness and rebellion. And so his words are as relevant today, for example, to the visible church today, where sadly, in many cases, despite receiving the gospel, despite receiving all the blessings from the gospel, and I'm thinking particularly of the Western church here, and nevertheless, they've turned their back on God and are now living in apostasy and are not preaching the gospel. And we think of our own country, which is a country which has experienced the influence of God but which is today increasingly becoming secular uh, and pagan, as some lands which have openly rejected the gospel. Of course, it applies to individuals too. There are individuals who have heard the gospel, maybe grown up in a Christian family, or had Christian teachers at some point, and then sadly have rejected God and rejected the gospel. So when we look at our world around us and we ask the question, what is wrong with our world? And the answer is that we've turned our back on God and the things that we have put in place are not really working. Why is it that the optimistic dreams, 
that the politicians present to us of a better society prove again and again to be elusive, unattainable, uh, one might frankly say fantasies. Uh, let's, uh, the, the root cause is that we human beings, we are really like the tenants and we want to be like the owners. If we go back to the parable, the tenants wanted to be like the owners. It's been like that since the very beginning. That was the problem in Genesis chapter 3, where sin entered the world, is that the devil managed to tempt um, Adam and Eve to try and change from being uh, tenants, stewards of God's creation and goodness, and he tempted them to want to become like God himself. And that is the basic uh, issue. That is still around us today. We um, know in our heart of hearts what God wants from us. That's where the work ought, where the word ought or obligation comes from. It's a way of acknowledging. Intuitively, we know that there is some higher authority. That the rules and laws and boundaries that we need to live under need to come from a higher authority. That is God Himself. But the world in which we live today has rejected the higher authority. And it has rejected God's norms and rules and standards that he's put in place because after all, he is the creator and the things that he has put in place are there for our good, our benefit and our blessing. And we have rejected them. And that is precisely the problem with all forms of the humanistic philosophy that we have all around us today. They've dominated our culture over the last um, two centuries. It leaves no room, no access for a higher authority, any form of higher authority, i.e. God, is completely abandoned and ruled out. And that gives rise to the anarchy, the chaos, the violence, uh, people clashing with each other, which we see all around us in one form or another uh, today. The, the root of the matter, the basic issue of the matter is that we human beings are just too greedy, too selfish, too corrupt, to bring any kind of utopian dream to any kind of uh, reality. So that is how Jesus understood the world. That's the first point that he leaves with us, how he understood the world, how he understands the condition of us human beings. But then secondly, we move on and we see how Jesus understood his mission. It's there in verse 13. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. And so here we see the patience of God. Despite our waywardness, God is patient. God offers the opportunity for repentance and turning back to him. He continues to show mercy. He does the same here to the tenants in the, in, in, in the vineyard who have proved to be such bad uh, people and bad tenants. He says, I will send my precious son, my son whom I love, and let's see if they will listen uh, to him. And so Jesus actually introduces himself as a character in the own story that he is telling, because obviously he is the son that is being referred to here. And it's clear what Jesus is saying in verses 10 to 12. These servants, these prophets who came before me, they were the servants of God. But I'm different. I'm special. I am the beloved uh, son. Jesus is indeed the son of God. And he's quite distinct from the servants. And the prophets who came before, the son comes not merely to represent the king, he comes to be the king. And Jesus comes with the most specific purpose of asserting the father's rights over his rebellious vineyard tenants. He comes as the Messiah to inaugurate the long awaited kingdom of God about which the prophets had spoken. And of course, here in again lies a sticking point in our world today. We live in this very pluralistic society today where all religions are considered to be equal and all rights to exclusivity are viewed with great suspicion and anger uh, and opposition. So it's fine in our pluralistic generation if we uh, simply speak of Jesus in non-exclusive terms. It's fine if we say he's a prophet or a philosopher or a guru or a good example uh, or anything like that, because there's nothing unique about those titles. But as soon as we say that he is the unique son of God, I am the way, the truth and the life. 
uh, that he claims to be God's final word, that he claims to be his beloved son. Then, of course, we run into problems and we are told that we are narrow and bigoted um, and we're being unfair and unkind to others. But that is who, how he addresses himself as the unique son of God and the only way by which we can get right with God. And so it's not surprising then that the response to him today is the same as it was of the tenants in the story in verse 14. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. And that is precisely what happened to Jesus just a few days after he told this final parable. And so we come to the third and the final point. Yes, we've seen how Jesus understands the world in which we live has been rebellious against God. The human condition is not fundamentally good, it's corrupt. We have seen how he understands his own mission as the final word from God to us to redeem us and save us. And then we see thirdly how he understands the future. We're now in verse uh, 15 or verse 16. Verse 16, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Now, when the Jewish leaders reject Messiah, they would, of course, forfeit the vineyard, as it were. They would forfeit their spiritual privileges for a period of time to the Gentiles. But, of course, it has wider application. When churches reject the word of God, and we see that happening, sadly, a lot in the mainline denominations. Um, then God leaves them. And we see that in the declining membership today. George Carey, who himself was an archbishop of the Church of England in England, said on one occasion, there are clear signs that God is giving the vineyard to others under the very noses of the bishops. Meaning, this is why we're getting these independent churches who are preaching the gospel arising to take the place of the so-called established church, because God will always have a witness. And if one group won't do it, then he'll cause another group to, to rise up um, who, will, uh, who will, in fact, do it. But it has even wider application than that. You see, if a nation or an individual rejects God and we reject the laws of God, we shouldn't be surprised that economic prosperity is drying up and that crime rates and violence are soaring, because that is the outcome of anarchy, um, and, uh, and there being no stabilizing influence in the world and in society anymore. But Jesus' final message to us is that there is a final judgment that is coming. This is what verses 17 and 18 are all about. He takes three verses from the Old Testament. They are familiar with these. The first one is from Psalm um, 118, Isaiah 8, Daniel uh, chapter 2. And what it all amounts to is that the story of the rejected son in the parable is confirmed by the scripture of the rejected stone. And the quotation from Daniel speaks of a stone or a rock symbolizing the kingdom of God, which will be used at the end of the age as a hammer in God's hands to destroy all the opposition kingdoms of the earth, and they will be smashed to smithereens. It's a very solemn warning. It's a very serious warning. The stone, the builder, discarded, that is Jesus himself, now lies on the ground. He says to them, you are plotting the murder of God's son. But the day is coming on his second return to this world when that same stone, that same son will be raised up. And for people who have rejected him, it will no longer be they who fall over him, but rather he who falls over them. And so there will be a day of accountability, a day for the when people who have missed the rent per the story will have to be accountable, where those injured servants will be vindicated, where the murdered son will be vindicated. How does G Jesus see the future? He sees it as a day of reckoning, a day of accounting, a day of judgment. I know, dear friends, it's not popular today, but we have to speak and say what the word of God clearly says to us. So, Lord, help us today. To receive this word, we know it's a strong word, but it's a word that our world and our society desperately needs to hear today. And sadly, Lord, there are not too many pulpits where it is being clearly preached from. And we pray that you will use it in your goodness, in your kindness, 
to bring maybe just one person today, Lord, to repentance for the first time and belief and trust in you. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today and God bless you all.